So welcome to today's show. Uh, we've got a fantastic guest today, Tom Balladino, who is the creator of Scalar Energy. And that is off the back of Tesla's work. So obviously, most of you are probably familiar with who Tesla is. Uh, but this gentleman here is actually carrying on the fantastic work that Tesla started. Um, so here he is. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to our discussion. So am I. I mean, we spoke off air, didn't we, uh, uh, previously, and it was such an interesting conversation actually make some notes. Um, but if you'd just like to explain to the listeners exactly what Scalar Energy is, why you've actually started to research on this area, and what you're hoping people can gain from that particular energy. Yeah. It is technology, Scalar technology, Tesla technology. That's the important uh, point I, I want to emphasize. This is a new science. Scalar energy is not electricity. It's a different type of energy. And it offers mankind the prospect of improving our lifestyle. If we would have listened to Nikola Tesla, that we would live a different world today, but we did not do that. So this technology, like any technology when used appropriately, will help mankind. I want to help mankind. So do you feel that obviously the work of Tesla, you, you mentioned we haven't followed in his footsteps. Do you think that was intentional from the elites or would, do you think that's just lost knowledge as it were? It, it's intentional from the elite. The Rockefellers, the, the Rothschild had it out for them. They did not support him. They actually started a smear campaign against him. And this was intentional, obviously. Why? Because they were threatened by this technology. This technology will make much of industry today obsolete because it's free energy, it's a different way of, of approaching a problem. It's a much more uh, economic, it's much cleaner, it's much simpler. But uh, the, the power structure that exists today wants to burden mankind. The power structure wants to, uh, if you will, uh, in many ways, enslave us, whereas scalar energy will liberate mankind. So it's an intentional suppression. It's, it's not by accident. It's funny, it's, isn't it's it? Not, because, it's not a. It's funny because Tesla ha made so many inventions, including alternating and, and direct current. And direct current is something that we use today, but we don't use alternating current, which is obviously uh, much more uh, uh, illustrious, much more uh, um, focused, and it's better, isn't it, in terms of resourcefulness? So, what is it that, that scalar energy and specifically your uh, uh, adaptation of scale of energy that is, has showing or is showing a threat to civilization and, and to the elites essentially. Yeah. Well, how do I operate my instrument? It's not through a grid system that I've created. The grid system is the universe. So if you can imagine our current electrical grid system, it's very expensive. It's rather detailed and, and rather, if you will, it's just expensive to run. Whereas my paradigm that I looked at, the scalar energy paradigm, my laboratory, I don't need wires. I don't need a satellite. I don't need uh, uh, any type of uh, substation. I, I don't need a, any type of conduit or any, any type of expensive relay station, et cetera, or transponder. The universe is the satellite. And I can send my energy anywhere in the world by way of a, this wireless transmission. So, you know, it's less than a penny on the dollar in savings. So this, this is a real threat to those who, who want to, if you will, meter the, the energy, who want to make money off the energy. Free energy from the stars, scalar energy, radiant energy. That's anathema to the elite. They want to make money off this. So in terms of if we look at the spectrum of, of light or the spectrum of waves, we obviously have a, such a minute understanding, not understanding, but what we can see as visible light. So as an example, your remote, when you put that to the TV, yeah, there's an infrared ray that actually comes out, but we can't see that. Much like the ultraviolet light, obviously, when you get the ultraviolet pen, you can see what's written there in, in, in sort of uh, invisible ink, as it were. So uh, is what you're saying that you're using this energy to harness the other areas that we're unable to see. Is that fair? 
I, I would say that scalar energy is an entirely different dimension. It's a different spectrum of energy. Okay. So if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, there's a range, if you will. Well, we're, we don't work within that range. It, this is the, the very quiddity of scalar energy. It's a different dimension. It, it has nothing to do with electricity or magnetism. It is a separate energy source. And the key point is this, it's clean, it's free, it's from the sun and the stars. And once we learn how to harness this energy, and I'm starting to learn how to harness this energy, it, it essentially makes obsolete so many of the current systems that we're using, which are harmful, which pollute, which are expensive, and in which the energy paradigm we're under now it, is limited, whereas scalar energy is unlimited. I, I can't stress enough how this, this new technology will change the course of history. So, so for those listening, they've heard the word scalar a number of times now. Can you explain to them sort of exactly what it is, how yeah. it works, and what you're trying to achieve by utilizing yeah. this, this piece? I think scalar energy is divine. It's from God. I believe what, what many people call consciousness or ohm or the life force energy. I believe the sun and the stars are the storehouses, if you will, the points of origin of this energy. I've seen it photographed uh, only by a time-lapse uh, photograph, and it, it is a double helix. It looks like a, a DNA clone. Matter of fact, I believe scalar energy is a double helix, creates our DNA. And what I've learned is this is a different dimension. And once you're in that dimension of scalar energy, you transcend time and space. You overcome time and space because scalar energy is the cause of time and space. So if you're within that paradigm that causes, that creates time and space, you're no longer subject to time and space. So obviously with the, with the helixes, et cetera, and as you're saying, it's, it's universal energy. Do you feel that, well, two things. Number one, do you feel that with regards to the stars, the pyramids, you know, if you look at the pyramids of Giza, that as well as the speed of light, the speed of sound, all the dimensions that we can go into hundreds there. One thing they do also have is the mapping of the stars, including Orion's belt. Do you feel that they, number one, do you feel that they understood that, first of all? And secondly, do you feel that the creator with regards to helixes, there is like a sub uh, a subset that, that filters down? So as an example, as you said, with the, the light, but then we have DNA. And then if you go further down into the cells, there's the same patterns over and over again. You feel that that's something that shows that there's an in imprint or a fingerprint from the creator. Yes, there is. Everything is a fractal. And if you look at the uh, scalar wave, it is a phi ratio, meaning that there's a major groove and a minor groove. The major groove is 1.618, the length, the minor groove, which is one. So if you look at that, Phi concept, the value phi 1.618 dot dot dot. It's a transcendent number. It's embedded in the phi spiral in a, every scalar wave. So scalar energy is creating what a phi concept. The golden mean ratio is found throughout nature. The coding for the golden mean, the coding for the divine proportion, is in a scalar wave, which has a major to minor groove ratio of 1.618. So yes, the universe is a fractal and, and scalar energy uh, creates that, that fractal network, if you will, by all means. That's why phi, that's why the Fibonacci sequence is found throughout nature because a scalar wave creates that Fibonacci sequence. You're right. It's, it's funny you've just and said then that. If you look, yes. Because I've literally I've got a notepad in front of me as, as you do when you have conversations on, on podcasts. And I wrote down two things before you said them. Golden ratio and Fibonacci, because that's from what you already said, it already triggered those things in my mind that when you said the one, 1. 1.618, it's like, okay, well, isn't that the golden ratio? Okay, well, isn't that the Fibonacci sequence? And yes. from what you said prior to that in terms of the embeddedness, and this is the argument I have with people. And, and if we go back 10 or 15 years, I probably didn't believe in the creator, God, universe, etc. But the more you look at it with an intelligent mind, the more you start to realize, okay, well, if the house you are living in is designed and it's got dimensions and a structure and a bedroom and a bathroom that have functions, if 
the um uh, the car that you're driving is designed because it again has different systems it's got wheels that do a job it's got steering wheel and gearbox etc if we can accept that they are designed why can we not accept that the universe is created the, that nature is created that obviously dna is a code pi is a code yes the golden ratio is a code that essentially are fingerprints yes. or footprints of the creator because if if something is random it doesn't have consistent uh consistent variables or consistent very probably not the right word consistent um uh, structures within them it has variable structures that are completely different than one another like even gravity 9.81 newton meters now science is not to say that we created gravity we just run experiments to deduce what the constants are um so can you explain a little bit more about why scalar energy harnesses all of those inherent yes. creative variables and maximizes the energy that we can create at, at a minimal yes. or no cost Exactly. It has to be divine. This is not a coincidence. This is not an accident. So if I were God, I would look at the universe and say, hmm, how am I going to create? I would love to create with light, light energy, non-physical light. And that's what God does. Scalar energy is non-physical. It carries instructions. It's the mind of God. And embodied in this scalar wave is that concept of phi, the golden mean, the golden proportion. Well, put all of that into its perspective the cause scalar energy produces the result creation it's cause and effect so the grand design is the scalar wave that downloads that creates a fibonacci sequence the golden mean the golden ratio throughout creation you're right it's not random and once we understand that this fundament that scalar energy embodies that divine proportion then we see that, yes, the universe is a fractal and that this intelligence, this creative intelligence, is, it has to be from God. You know, who else could create the stars and have the stars send out information or intelligence? Well, it's, it, I think it's a case as well as that energy is never lost. And how the world is currently, energy gets, it's not that it gets lost, it just doesn't get utilized correctly. And from what you're saying, the scalar energy side of things or scalar light is whereby you're harnessing every ounce of energy that's available in the universe that then gives you a very cost effective and unlimitedly abundant supply of energy as opposed to you know plugging something into the TV screen. You're absolutely right. And this is what Tessa defines. He had a tower in Colorado Springs, Colorado in 1899. It was a scalar energy tower. And if you look closely at this tower, there's no lines, telephone lines or substations. They're, they're, you know, it was up in the Rocky Mountains in 1899. He was harnessing his energy for the tower from the stars. He produced free energy from the stars on the side of a mountain in Colorado. In 1899. So he was successful in using scalar energy, radiant energy for free energy. He demonstrated that time and time again. Well, the thing, the good thing about Tesla, and the, the, well, obviously everyone knows he's such a, a fantastic mind, but he had so many inventions, including radio waves, including, as I said, alternating direct current, etc. But he also in invented the light bulb, didn't he? Because Thomas Edison actually stole that from him. Yeah. Yeah, Tessa, Tessa he, he really wasn't interested in making money. He was such a pure genius and a great humanitarian that in many ways, uh, uh, he, he, his work far surpasses that of Edison, Marconi, even Westinghouse. There, there's nobody like Tessa. Nobody can match him. Because I heard something, I don't know if this is true, so it will need to be obviously fact-checked at some point, but I heard something that Tesla um, was approached by the US government for a basically missile defense system that they utilized but didn't utilize because obviously they could profit from that in respect of defending their country and defending their uh, position as, as governmental and being at the top of that hierarchy. But the question would be then, why didn't they implement the alternating current and a lot of his other, <laughs> his other inventions that maybe they can't uh, monetize, uh, let's say? Yeah, yeah. Tessa gave us AC electricity. <clears throat> Edison was really 
staunch to, to give the world DC electricity, but AC electricity is much more practical in, in application. And then later in his life, Tesla discovered or started working with scalar energy, and he used the term radiant energy. You really have to look at his notes carefully. He was no longer using the term electromotive of force or, or, or electricity. He was using the term radiant energy, meaning scalar energy. The latter part of Tesla's life is still shrouded in mystery. The, the powers that be realized that he discovered free energy. And this is why his work, especially the latter part of his life, is suppressed. Whereas his earlier work, AC electricity, has been used with vogue today. So what? So now that you're sort of taking over the footsteps of Tesla, what sort of impact do you feel that you can bring to the world? Assuming, of course, you'll you get past the hurdles of governments and the elitists and those that control industries, um, so that you are a replacement as opposed to a competitor in 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 that sense. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, I need God's protection, God's direction. You know, if, if scalar energy will be embraced by society as free energy, it will change industry. It will change lives. So this really is a sea change coming for humanity. It's an incredible experience that we're, we're going to witness, many of us in our lifetime. Now, in many ways, I have to duplicate Tesla's results. Tesla had a free energy tower in Colorado Springs. So I have to work on a miniature scale, miniaturize my work, so that I can likewise duplicate his free energy power that he had in Colorado Springs. But much like JFK, who sort of was blowing the whistle on these secret societies and the fractional reserve banking system, obviously that changed from the golden, uh, the you know, the gold backed secure uh, uh, measure of essentially from, well, I think it was 1971, wasn't it? President Nixon that implemented that. Do you feel that with, Today's day and age, do you feel that you have more or less of a chance of changing the tide with social media? Because social media, we, as we know, can be a positive and a negative yeah. in terms of getting your message out. You know, if it's a good, if it's good, you know, people will love it. But if if it's if you get put in the wrong hands or the wrong people through or threatened, um, how are you going to go about? And probably not too much in detail, of course, uh, for obvious reasons. But are there things that you're thinking about about maybe avoiding those conflicts? With, yeah, with God's help, God's protection, God's insight, and in, and in, in working with people. What I what we see throughout the centuries is a concept never dies. You can have a good concept, and the, and the people can benefit from it. A good idea, ideas never die. A concept, a movement never dies if it's if it's practical. So if I can impress upon people that scalar energy will help, will abet society, the people will clamor for it. The people will, will ask for this to come forward. So that's my approach. I work as a grassroots level, people, God's protection, and I avoid big business. I avoid corrupt governments. I avoid corrupt people in academia. I just I don't have time for corruption. Well, that's good because I think that the way that we need to be as a civilization is to get rid of corruption as much as possible so that we can actually move forward as a civilization. Um, in terms of the the actual technology, if that's the best word to use itself, does it have anything in in um in respect of quantum entanglement? Uh, quantum physics, maybe the particle slips experiment, because they're all very interesting things. You know, Isaac Newton's talked about a spooky connection at a distance. Is that something that's implemented within the scale yes. of energy? Yes, yes, because in a scalar energy paradigm, everything in the universe communicates. You have to divorce yourself now temporarily of Newtonian physics, and you have to say to yourself, what is quantum physics? It's the perfect communication system. So if you do have quantum entanglement, in which one object at this end of the universe can communicate instantaneously with another object trillions of miles away, it's only through that quantum energy that that communication is possible. Or that all, all physical objects in the universe have some threads, some invisible threads, so to speak, that connects them. Well, that invisible thread, that 
is the scalar energy, which again sends time and space. So you have the perfect communication system and that can only be had and only be realized by scalar energy. And the, the sequence to that is quantum entanglement, which is which is just normal in such a paradigm. It's, it's, it's to be expected. If you have perfect communication, perfect connection, then everything is entangled. Everything is communicates instantaneously. But for those skeptics out there that feel that this sounds a little bit far-fetched, can you explain, and I, I sort of know this myself, there is science behind this, isn't there? Quantum physics is a field that maybe yeah. a number of years ago yeah. didn't, uh, wasn't respected, but now there is no ignoring the evidence that's there in terms of the double slits experiment where things, when they're observed, change. In terms of yes. the quantum entanglement, as you've mentioned, the connection from a distance, and it's impossible to understand yes. how things communicate at that distance. Do you, do you want to shed a little bit of light on the, the yeah. science behind it and, and why it's such an important um, uh, understanding that that humans need to, to, to utilise as soon as possible in order to move forward to civilization. Yeah, very good. I agree. I'm going to give the audience a perfect uh, uh, example how we are using quantum theory every day in thought, in thinking. What is a thought? It, it's a quantum energy. When you think, when any type of cerebration is, is thinking, any type of cognitive activity is a scalar energy or, or radiant energy, call it what you will. And the fact that you can think about, uh, have a notion of something that's intangible, invisible, shows that you, your mind can construe something that's invisible or that you can think across the centuries and project into the future or think back in the past that shows that you're transcending time by projecting into the future or, or looking back at the past. The fact that you, a thought can travel throughout the universe instantaneously, that's quantum entanglement. The fact that thinking a thought that you, you can, if you will, consider or at least hypothesize that stars exist on the edge of the universe, so to speak, that means that your thoughts, your projection, goes to the far reaches of the universe. The universe is infinite. So what is my point? Thinking is quantum action. Because the, all the, the thinking is quantum action. It transcends time and space. But this is a beautiful part of it because there's, there's, there's a dance going on, isn't there? Because for a lot of people who maybe listen to this podcast or other podcasts, motivational speakers, etc., they talk about thoughts are things. They talk about... James Allen, you know, as a man thinketh, so he is. They talk about the law of attraction, but they see that as maybe separate from, from what you're saying. But actually, if you yeah. actually listen to two sides of the same argument, as it, as it were, it all fits together, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You know, just consider thinking is non-physical, scalar energy is non-physical. Thinking transcends time and space, scalar energy transcends time and space. Thinking is, is this collective consciousness. How, how do I have a thought? Through the collective consciousness, which is scalar energy. So all human thinking, memory, cognition, uh, intention, it's, it's a scalar energy action. We are scalar energy beings. Without scalar energy, we could not think. If you shut off all the scalar energy in the universe, nobody could think. Everybody would, everybody would die instantaneously. So do you think this at is same, where at the same time? So do you think this is where walking into a room and you feel the vibe comes from? Do you feel that that's where gut instinct comes from? Do you feel that's where insights come from? Because you might be sitting there and thinking, and an idea pops into your head. Where does that come from? Is that all coming from the same sort of consciousness as, as you as you alluded to earlier? Exactly. Some people they, some people call it women's intuition. Some people call it a hunch. <laughs> Uh, others people say it's, it's a business instinct. Other people say it's mysticism. Well, that's information. Maybe it's prophecy. Maybe some people can read souls. Other people have the ability to see auras. That's all information. That's all intention. That's intelligence. And where does that come from? It has to come from a body of knowledge. The mind of God, the Akashic record, the Alpha and the Omega. All of those are synonymous terms. What? revealing to us that 
the universe is indeed infinite. God created an infinite universe with infinite intelligence. And the way you gain entrance into that infinite intelligence is through the scalar energy portal. But this is the beautiful part. And in, you mentioned uh, synonymous words there, which I think is um, fantastic to talk about because depending on the words you use, there are connotations yeah. for people that they think of negatively. So, oh, they're a psychic or a mystic. They might see that as negative. Oh, uh, uh, this person is um, someone who can see the future or they, you know, ideas pop into their head. If you if you have words like even God, for example, God can have negative connotations to people, can't it? Um, and religion. But if you yeah. were to use, use the word universe, consciousness, creator, that has positive connotations. So uh, do you feel that depending on how you explain something will determine how it's received on the other side. Yes, exactly. Vocabulary is so important. Now, I want to make this very clear. As a new science, this is a new and emerging science, we're still trying to decide on the dictionary, if you will. What what terms should we use to describe scalar energy? You ask, you, know, you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different answers. So like any science, you need a common language. We haven't, we don't have those common terms yet. So I'm trying to trying to develop those common terms. So in terms of common terms, you mentioned an instrument last time, which is probably uh, the first okay. piece of jargon that, that we that we talked about. How, in explaining it in the simplest way possible, how does your instrument operate and yeah. what does it produce that's going to benefit uh, humankind? I have a scalar energy instrument that harnesses scalar energy. That's it. It does not work with electricity. It works exclusively with scalar energy. And when you work with scalar energy, you can perform many functions. You can achieve which with scalar energy that you cannot achieve with electricity. So scalar energy gives me greater command, dominion over nature. If you want to control nature, you do it with scalar energy, not with electricity. So a scalar energy instrument allows us to control, to have a mandate over nature. Now, what is my point? Well, if you look at the instruments that today, many of them have a command, a control over nature, which we can subdue nature, which we can control nature to our benefit. I'm saying that scalar energy is the best tool to control, to subdue nature, to have dominion over nature. If you have dominion over nature, then you can you can instruct nature what you want it to do. So if we've got that relationship with nature, let's let's take um, yourself, myself, or any of the listeners as an example. So are you, you're saying that ourselves as individuals are quantumly entangled, if that's the right explanation yes. or words for it, to every part of the universe, whether it's living or non-living, is that is that correct yes. as well? Yes, yes, very good, yep. Yeah, so, we're how all connected. Can, so, so how can we yes. utilize that to our advantage? We, we do that every day by being the, the community of God. We do that, you know, for the most part, the world is, is filled with peaceful people who want to be productive, who want to be happy. And when, when we see this, um, this working, this, this interlocking arrangement between people, families, tribes, nationalities, you know, different cultural beliefs, that that is really the spice of life, as I see it, when people work together. I've always said the big problem in this world is we fight. If we were united, I hope scalar energy will unite us. If we were united, we could do so much more. So do you think that that's because people are out of vibration? So I know Tesla had, what was it, Vortex Mathematics, where it was a 369 situation, and nine is obviously the key to the universe now, i know that music for example was changed from what was it uh from 432 hertz to 440 hertz was it and that's do you think that's had a huge impact as well on our resonance as individuals because yeah. for, as far as i'm concerned why was why was why did that get changed for anything other than negative reasons can you shed a little bit of light on that if you're familiar with I, it i i, I... 
I don't have knowledge of that. So I'll, I'll, I'll sidestep that. I don't have knowledge of that. But let me say this. And studies have proven this. Um, if, if you try and grow plants with, a, a, a say, symphonic music, Beethoven, Brahms, et cetera, yeah. those plants will thrive. Now, if you, if you play perhaps heavy metal rock, those plants do not respond favorably. So there's something in the, the, the frequency, there's something in the, the Hertz rating and something in the melody of classical composers that allows biological life to thrive as opposed to say rap music or, or heavy metal. Now this has been proven many times with, with scientific experiments. Now, now, if you like rap music or heavy metal, so be it. But now I'm trying to go back to nature. And if you imitate nature, and this is what many of the composers have done, Many composers, whether knowingly or unknowing, have phi incorporated the golden mean, the golden ratio incorporated in their music. Yeah. Well, this is a change I made recently. I used to listen to rap music, and probably over the last five years, I try to now listen to music with no words. Number one is because the words, like if you look at rap music, for example, you're getting up in the morning and it's talking about taking drugs and stabbing. It's not really a good way to start the day and you're bringing in messages that uh, uh, are detrimental to you on the flip side classical music so i listen to ludovico um and audi i listen to han zimmer and as you said that the resonance and feeling that you get is so different and i actually go hiking quite a lot as well in the mountains and the best way to try and understand how out of sync rap music is is when you're in the middle of a beautiful mountain walking through and you listen to rap music, it doesn't fit the scenario. Whereas classical music does, it just it just fits. It's like it was a match made. So I, I, I sort of get what you're saying there in, in terms of maybe that is one of many variables that is making humans fall out of sync with nature. And maybe that is where these bad people come from and not saying that everyone listens to that music is bad because as you said iner- inherently we are good people but maybe for those few who are out of sync in more than one way become bad people do you say that's fair yeah yeah i i agree with you you know you you are what you listen to and you are what you think and you're right today the media if we're exposed to violence or hatred or this you know, call it just a negative attitude. It, it has an impression upon our, our, our mind, our psyche. Now, there, there's many television programs I'd never watch. There are many movies I'd never would go to see a movie if they're violent or pornographic. It, it really is beneath man to, to indulge in this. And I, I would really encourage people, take a good look at yourself and do not frequent, don't, don't be don't be fooled by that type of media. Get away from it. It has an effect on you, and it's a deleterious effect. Yeah, I mean, something I spoke to someone about yesterday was that if we look at most people now, they have many apps on their phone, but they, but most of those apps are part of the seven deadly sins. So Deliveroo uh, is, is gluttony. Um, Netflix is sloth. Tinder is lust. Uh, LinkedIn is greed. Um jealousy is uh facebook pride is instagram and if you're on those all all day again that maybe takes away from your uh capacity to uh to operate uh and function correctly but bringing this back to scalar because i think that is obviously fundamentally what we're talking about and all of these other parts fit in with with scalar energy and its resonance and the golden ratio etc what are your long-term and appreciate you probably won't be able to give the full details of this, but what are your long-term goals and applications for the world on the whole? Uh, if God gives me the wisdom or somebody the wisdom, we will be able to recreate Tesla's work. We will be able to, to use scalar energy as wireless energy to illuminate objects. Now imagine the, the, the illumination that you're afforded by electricity today in your home. Imagine if you did not need a, Telephone wires, conduit. You did not need a substation. You didn't. You don't need a power plant. Some of those power plants work with coal. Some of them work with hydroelectric. Imagine just tapping into the energy of the stars, 
and then using that energy to illuminate your home or your office. Imagine if we had free energy that we could illuminate the world. That, that's a step forward that would serve to, to start solving the energy crisis. Tesla developed a, a car that worked on scalar energy. He did not depend upon a combustion engine. Well, look how expensive it is today to put petrol, gasoline in your car. Why don't we power our cars with the sun, the star energy? So again, this free energy will change society. It will liberate mankind. We finally will thrive as a society. We can't go on like this with high inflation, with exorbitant energy costs, a, a, a taxation that, that is just stifling progress. Society is crumbling. Well, this is what I think, because in, in terms of the pyramids of Giza, that, as we said earlier, are aligned with Orion's belt and the stars, they used to be covered in limestone, didn't they, with, with I think, gold at the top. So they could have been set up to be an alternating current setup yeah. to provide free energy. But from what you found, you mentioned Tesla's work, what gaps have you found in terms of the documentation that maybe you've had to fill yourself, first of all? And where did you get the inspiration yeah. to follow his work from? Uh, there's a great book that Tessa wrote, his, his 1899 notes from Colorado Springs, and you could read that. And whatever I could uh, decipher from that, I knew that he was no longer working with electricity. So you really have to look at Tessa's career and another man by the name of Hieronymus. Although this the literature is not abundant, nonetheless, you still have to intuit in, in many ways what these two scientists were doing, Tessa and Hieronymus. And lo long and short of it is, although both men began their careers as electrical engineers, they ended their careers as scalar energy scientists. I think that's notable. So do you, do you feel that they found something out about electricity and that they evolved into more complicated, yes. well, maybe not more complicated, yes. but more efficient uh, uh, utilizations of energy? Yeah. yeah. What, yeah what, exactly. do you, what, what do you look do you... at Tesla's career? So go on. Tesla's career he began with AC electricity. He had many inventions and patents that were awarded due to his AC electricity. The, the latter, say, 20, 30 years of his life, there were no patents from him. And you know, the people did not understand what he was doing. He was no longer working with electricity. So he did not want to give his, his work to any patent office. So much of what Tesla discovered went to the grave with him which was scalar energy. We've embraced his early career, AC electricity, his, his latter, the second part of his career, radiant energy, it's still a mystery. So how, if you were to look at a percentage, 0% zero, percent, zero understanding of, of scalar energy and, uh, and, and, and everything surrounding that, and radiant energy, as you said, or 100% uh, being 100, of course, where do you feel that both you and us as a whole collectively are um, in terms of where we should be. Yeah, it, it's sadly scalar energy is poorly understood. And a lot of people sadly try and fit their square peg into the round hole, it doesn't work. And people have to realize that there's two energies. The electromagnetic theory, much of it is valid, but there's another theory, scalar energy theory. And the two energies are, are distinct. They're di <clears throat> so once we understand that, then we have to, begin with this science. It's going to be a new science, scalar energy. And um, you know, not to be condescending, but you have to start at, at square one. You might have to start at first grade, but if you're studying scalar energy, you need to start. I had to start 30 years ago. And a few years back, I was in first grade. I, I'm now making progress. So now that people understand, as you've eloquently put, what scalar energy is and that it's abundant. And I feel that most people can understand, look, there is energy given out by the sun. There is energy given out by the stars. How are you able to capture it? I think that's the, probably the next question down to say, yeah. well, okay, now we know this energy is there. What, how are we capturing it and how are we maintaining or collecting all of the energy uh, available? I, I was working under the Hieronymus family that developed their energy instrument. Galen and Sarah Hieronymus, and I met the wife of the inventor, her name is Sarah Hieronymus, and I was able to work in their laboratory in which um, the Hieronymus family would take 
AC electricity and convert it into scalar. And I've observed this, this principle. You can take AC electricity, convert it into scalar or vice versa, take scalar and it will degrade into AC electricity. Now, put all of that in perspective, I work with scalar energy instruments in which I initially take the power from an AC current, household current, and it's converted into scalar. And once it converts into scalar, it's much more powerful, so to speak, than, than, the, than the beginning, than the initial surge of AC electricity. So that in and of itself shows that, this, that there's a gain, that there's a power gain from AC electricity to scalar. Now, if I can just amplify the wave, then the power gain should be a millionfold or a billionfold. If, if you look at scalar energy, you have to consider there's no entropy. The signal never weakens. So now I don't have to worry about entropy. All I have to worry about is amplifying the signal. So that's interesting because, as we said earlier, energy is generally on conversion. It's not lost, but it's hard to capture everything. So what you're saying is that scalar actually is harnessed above and beyond the energy that's that's yes. created from AC. Is that is that correct? That you're uh, in what in what my understanding yes, is there's that there's a gain. Yes, yes, there's a gain. There, uh, I am. If I start with AC electricity, the what is derived is scalar wave is an increase, a significant increase as compared vis-a-vis -vis the AC electricity that formed, that served to form the scalar wave. Now, why do I say that? Because any type of uh, electrical apparatus, you always experience entropy. You have to deal every, every second you see a weakening of the signal. As soon as you have a scalar wave, there's no weakening. It so, never weakens. So... Do we actually understand why that's the case, or is it just a case at this point, as we talked earlier about gravity, where we realise it's nine point eight one newton meters? Do are we now at a point where we are just observing and and working out the relationships, or do we have a deeper understanding, whether it's yourself or whether it's the Hieronymus family, um, or both? Do we have a are we at a good level of understanding now about how this all works? I, I think we're developing that and so much needs to be done, but <clears throat> suffice to say for this conversation, this immediate consideration, scalar energy is a timeless energy. It, it does not experience a weakening. There's no degradation. Hence, there's no entropy. Now, what do I mean? If there's no entropy, it's perpetual. So what, what is my statement? Scalar energy is a perpetual source of energy. I see it in my laboratory all day long. I work with people around the world with this perpetual energy. When I deliver this energy, whether it's to this world or to a star or, or to a planet, the signal remains the same of the same intensity, so to speak. Once it leaves my laboratory, once it connects with anywhere in the universe, there's no entropy. It's perfect perpetual energy. So, so in that respect, and if I can get my, my mind around this, there's could could it be said or my sort of thought process is that there's two sort of circuits or spectrums of energy one is the light uh heat uh sound uh wave energy etc whereby it has to be converted between each other if that makes sense so you know when you break in your car yeah. it converts yeah. to kinetic energy and heat energy and sound energy so for yeah. scalar it's it's a bit like a train track whereby it just can keeps going and, and, and there's no stops. There's no platform nine and three quarters where you can yes. jump off and convert to a different line. It's it's yes. the underlying fundamental energy of all other energies. Is that fair to say that my understanding is correct yes. on that? Yes, that's correct. And just imagine this perpetual energy. If you're in a perfect scalar energy force field in a perfect scalar energy environment, the energy never weakens. In, in other words, it's perpetual life. Perpetual energy means perpetual life. I firmly believe there is a heaven. And in that heaven, you have to have perpetual life. You have to have perpetual energy. So perpetual energy gives you perpetual life. It's immortality. So could this be used for anything other than energy? Could it be used for healing purposes? Could it be used for teleportation as a, a very... Uh, uh, exciting idea whether it's possible or not is, is different but are, do you feel that there's other applications once we get a little bit deeper into this energy that 
could change things significantly into uh, even more. Yes, there's thousands of applications. Why? If scalar energy creates and maintains a universe, then look at the thousands of, of instances in which scalar energy is creating and maintaining the universe. Everything from gravity to health to telecommunications to thinking, everything is go governed by scalar energy. So if you can govern scalar energy, you can govern the universe. So question I would ask then is why is it taking this long for someone to follow in Tesla's footsteps? And I know that we can talk about the suppression oh, of yeah. information yeah. as it has been throughout history, uh, Alexandria Library, Vatican, etc. Do you feel that it's just the suppression that's that's hindered our progress in that area? I, I think suppression is part of it. And I think just a lack of understanding and, and no fault of the people. And, the, and a lot of people, they just don't realize that there's two energies. So many people look at Tesla's work and they still try to compare it to AC electricity. That's only true as to the earlier part of his career. There's two energies and Tesla de developed radiant energy theories later in his life. And just by the fact that he started calling this energy radiant energy means that he was working with a different type of energy. He was no longer working with AC electricity. Long and short of it is educational process. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, to your audience. This takes time. It's a new science. I don't expect people to get this lickety split. No, I mean, even for, for myself, you know, we spoke off air and we've spoken obviously today as well and even for myself i'm i'm starting to get the gist of of of, of the importance of this because i'm a, a an advocate of tesla and looking at his, all of the inventions you think well how can one person in a single lifetime come up with all of this stuff and whether it's down to divine intervention whether it's you know him receiving information or whether he's just a genius on the material front or or a combination of both but if we look at the universe itself information wants to get to people how many times have you had an idea and a week later you see it in the news or you see someone started that idea? Yeah. Like, well is there a um a, like a, a wave of information coming out that some people pick up on and they say oh maybe i can do this and they talk themselves out of it and then some people act on it yeah. um, because it's amazing really how many times that's happened to me has it ever, ever happened to you as well tom of course, of course, you know, and many times you'll, you'll be reading about a concept and then in a few days you'll read about it again on the internet or through a book and you see yourself, my goodness, I thought this was, you know, a rather arcane subject. No, somebody else is putting forth that subject. So there is a collective consciousness. You know, many times people realize when you pray together, you raise that collective consciousness or you, you raise that, if you will, that, that Christ feel. So I, you know, I urge people to, to think well, be positive, have a productive lifestyle, pray. All of this, all of this abets this, this human condition. I think this is the beauty of obviously you coming on the show and talking with other people as well to get this message out there because like obviously we talked about Tesla being suppressed. We, the good thing about today's day and age is that this, this interview, this podcast and other podcasts you've been on are going to be here forever, really. So for anyone listening, they can say, okay, well, I didn't understand about this scale of energy. This scale of energy is really interesting. Let me have a look at this, watch some videos, do some research. And maybe they will then start looking at scale of energy. And then when you've got hundreds of people looking at the same thing, yes. it's very difficult to them to press the, uh, the information, which, and again, as we talked about earlier, the positives of social media are negatives. Negatives are that you can brainwash the masses with poor information, but the positives are when the truth comes out, it changes perception very, very quickly. And I think that with with the message that you're bringing, I think that's uh, something that can change things for the future if we can get it into the right hands and, and do the right things with it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So again, again to, to go down that route of, trying to improve human condition and using social media as our leverage. Um, we've touched upon the concept that a concept, call it radiant or scalar energy, it won't go away. The truth, you cannot suppress the truth forever. And it, the word is now getting out. 
people are starting to see that there are two energies and hence there's two possibilities. It's the, the wheels are turning. I'll say that. And it's unstoppable. now. So, so how fast could the wheels turn if they could go as fast as possible? So yeah. is it a case of funding? Is it a case of just getting it out there? Is it a case of your research going faster? Because I know just before we came on air, which we'll, we'll talk about now, you were talking about the research you're doing currently, which is what you really enjoy. So two, two part questions. So what were you researching and how fast do you think you can get this thing to market? Uh, I'm letting the audience know when I work with people, I work with people by way of a photograph or I can work with a collage of photographs. So I've developed a technique. I'm testing it out where I can, I should be able to work with a billion photographs of people instantaneously. In other words, my instrument, the way I've calibrated my theory, if it's correct, I should be able to work with a billion photographs in an instant. And at one particular point in time, I should be able to work with a billion people, a billion people. Now, if that's the case, and this is quantum healing for the world. And another theory that I've been working on, I've not been successful, but I've been working on a theory to amplify the energy. And I've experimented, but it's failed. Um, if I can amplify this energy, then I have a miniature star. And if I have a miniature star, I can power the world. But that's, I think that's a few years down the road. Well, I think that fail is not a bad thing. Uh, you know, fail is first attempt in learning or, you know, as Edison said, as I said, I think Tesla created the light bulb earlier anyway, but they said, you know, I've not failed. I found a thousand ways that the light bulb, you know, yeah. to basically not create the light bulb. So I think it's good that you're failing to an extent because it means that you're, you know, you're trying the right things, uh, the right things out. If we just go back to the photographs for a moment then. So if you can just explain a little bit more about how that works for the listeners, um, and obviously how that you, how you can help people to to utilize this energy for, as you said, the healing side of things or maybe something else as well. All right. So put your scalar thinking cap on. We're not going to speak about electricity. I'm holding up my photograph. My photograph is my bilocated version. If I take my photograph and place it in the scalar energy instrument, I bilocate to my instrument, so to speak. So people from around the world email me their photograph. So people don't have to travel to my laboratory. I'm treating their bilocated, it's like their identical twin, so to speak. And I can work with people by way of the concept of quantum entanglement through their photograph, because their photograph has a connection to that person or any photograph, if you will. So it's non-physical connection, it's non-physical communication, always by way of a person's photograph, because it seems that whatever a person is experiencing, the photograph experiences in real time. So the photograph reports a person's real time constitution. And in so doing, I can send energy, I can balance the chakras, I can create nutrients, I can identify and eradicate germs, microorganisms in the quantum field that matches simultaneously the biological field. So it seems that anything that I can do to a photograph is, is likewise mimicked by a person, by their bio, uh, what I would call their bioenergetic field instantaneously. So there seems to be a connection. Now I can't prove that connection, but, but for the sake of this conversation, a photograph is the bilocated version of a person. So in terms of quantum entanglement then, so is it only the person yeah who is connected to their photograph or are we connected to everything through quantum entanglement? Does that make sense? We are connected to everything through quantum entanglement. So when you're working in a scalar energy force field, not only do, can I connect with a person's energetic field, but I also connect through the entire universe. The entire universe connects through a, a quantum field or scalar energy force field. It's impossible for it not to. So when you're in a scalar energy force field, you automatically connect to the universe automatically. It's so, impossible not to. So, so my question was more in terms of the photograph. So is it the only the person whose photograph it is that they are connected to that photograph? That's correct. Yeah, because that's it's, correct. It's there. Because the instrument has to pick. Very good. The instrument has to pick up on that person. And how do we pick up on that person through their quantum field? 
There's an energy on any photograph. A photograph is a source of light. A scatter energy instrument can look at the scatter energy signature of a person and then find their quantum field. Keep in mind, all of this is non-physical. We only work with scatter energy. This is not Newtonian physics. It's a new physics. So, so drawings won't work. Paintings won't work. It has to be. Correct. It, it, yes. has, it has to be the physical person because when you take a photo, the light goes through the lens and it's captured, isn't it? So it's yes. it's those yes. particles of light that are connected to the individual, just so yes. I'm understanding it correctly in my own mind. Yes. Now let's go back to something you, you uh, posited earlier in our conversation. You could have two molecules or two objects at a distance, at a vast distance, that instantaneously communicate with one another. How do you have two objects that communicate with one another? The same way that a photograph communicates by way of that quantum entanglement. It's all communication, it's all energy transference, instantaneous communication, instantaneous energy transference in which my photograph communicates with me. How we do that? Well, it's gotta be quantum entanglement. So a couple of <clears throat> well, two, two part sort of thought process really. One is, are we connected to anything but our photograph? And actually, I'm answering my own question here because mothers of children can sense danger on behalf of their kids who are living across the world. They're like, well, something doesn't feel right. Let me call them up. So are there specific things that we are entangled with that other people aren't? So as an example, with our own kids or with the photographs, um, and how far does that branch out into various yeah. other items yeah you're, you're absolutely right so uh, some some parents will have a foreboding uh, feeling about their children at a distance why that's quantum entanglement so we now see how quantum entanglement scalar energy has its its play in, in our life some people have a premonition deja vu other people have the gift of prophecy some people simply have a knack for a musical instrument other people can, if you will, uh, predict the future, or, or other people have a bad feeling about somebody if they meet somebody, if their aura is not right. It's all information. How do we, where does that information come from? It has to be from the Kashic record. That's the mind of God. So if there's one final part of quantum uh, physics, quantum entanglement, scalar energy, uh, radiant energy that we maybe not discussed that you feel it's worthwhile the audience understanding what would that one thing be i would say that scalar energy once we harness this energy will allow us to become the king the queen of creation we will be able we will have angelic like power scalar energy will allow us to have dominion over nature we will be the kings the queens of nature which is an interesting and very empowering thought, isn't it? Yeah, it is. This, this is no toy. That we will have dominion over nature. Men will be king of, of nature. Women will be queens of nature. So one, one final question then. So if there's one thing that, that you feel that you need to improve on, whether that's in terms of research, whether that's in terms of the, the, uh, the product service experiments, or just in your personal life, what is one area that you want to improve? Uh, as a researcher, I want to be able to create anti-gravity instruments. I want to be able to use this energy to uh, to uh, travel uh, instant, well, not instantaneously, but at a high speed and safely. Uh, scalar energy research with uh, energy creation, with energy magnification to power the world. And also use this energy for telecommunications. Um, you'll never drop a signal. My cell phone drops signal. This, this cell phone operated with scalar energy. You never drop a signal. So the, it's wide open. It's, the field of possibilities is wide open. So how, how are you going about uh, trying to undertake that proposition? Are you just doing experiments at the moment, research? And what could you do more of to accelerate that process? All of the above, but most of all, I need God's help. This, this is uncharted waters. And as such, I need God's help. You're not going to learn this at, at a college. God has to teach this. 
And it's like in the book of Proverbs, it says something along the lines of the uh, the 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 wish for wisdom essentially is is the best thing. You know, you if you want to be yeah. wise, uh, that's yes, that's indeed. the start of 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 you evolving essentially. That's and indeed. the the fear yeah. of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I think is another phrase uh, mm-hmm. in Proverbs. So so yeah. So is how how can people reach out to you if they want to just pick your brain if they want to have a look at the photograph uh, uh, service or maybe they are researching this area as well and want to be a part of what you're building uh, the, oh, my website scalarlight.com s-c-a-l-a-r scalarlight.com this is the website and uh, we have a 15-day free session anybody can email their photograph and we will work with you through the photograph now it's quantum healing free of charge so start with the website i have probably 300 articles i've written regarding my research and what i've observed with scanner energy start there and then you decide how the future is going to pan out you decide how scanner energy is going to change the world so we'll put that in the the notes anyway so people will have those links but what results can they expect just to to sign off you know, many people, they tell us within the first week or so that their chakras are balanced. They have a feeling of bliss or tranquility. Or if people have, say, a pathogenic infection, they report that they're, they're no longer infected with some type of microorganism, some type of bacterium or fungus. So we leave the people decide because their te- the testimony of people is the beginning body of evidence for my work. This cannot be proven by academia. My work is groundbreaking, so nobody has been able to prove or disprove my work. So how do I prove it? By testimonies, by the people. That's the only way I can prove it. Right. But, uh, but with you know things I've heard about science anyway is that you cannot prove something beyond its hypothesis. And you know if you look back in in, in history, oh well, gravity wasn't proved, but oh, but it existed. But obviously, once it's proved, then oh, okay, now it only exists at this point. So I don't necessarily believe that things need to be proved uh, uh, essentially because they if, if something exists it exists it doesn't need to have a rubber stamp sometimes because you know it, it, it it's always existed um but yeah any, any final messages for the guests uh, or for the listeners rather i thank you for, for this opportunity to speak to your guests it's a very been a very enlightening uh, conversation i think we've, we've really planted some seeds some seeds for people to think upon absolutely well thanks again tom uh, and obviously hopefully a lot of the audience get in touch with you regarding the scalar energy and you know i really hope you know you you get this thing moving um on a, on a global scale and that we can change energy forever we will. we will thank you for the time no problem